Services marketing. Now this is going to be an overview of the overview. Services marketing is one of the subjects that we have on offer as a full length, full semester subject. It's also a large part of the applied use of marketing in practice and functionally it's its own sub-discipline within the overall marketing frameworks. So the content we're going to give you now is very much a highlights reel. It's a highlights package and there is a lot more depth and detail you can go into. But these are some of the interesting things that we think should be covered for those people who are just going to be staying for the duration of intro to marketing and a sort of teaser trailer for those people who want to go on and do the major. So the first thing to consider is that when we talk about services, we are talking about the, it's a subset of product. So you may occasionally come across people saying uh, products and services, that's incorrect, it's goods and services. All services, marketing, value offerings are functionally products. It's just that in services, the emphasis is on the delivery of a skill-based product where it's skills applied to a person, to a product, an idea, or an experience. This means that as opposed to goods-based marketing, which is all about the physical tangible object, services is all about the experience, the output, and the outcome. And there are a few differences that come along with that framework. They are known as the four pillars of services, intangibility, inseparability, inconsistency, and inventory. Also known as the IHIP model, intangibility, heterogeneity, inseparability, and perishability. So intangibility is the idea that the core and actual product of a service are the benefits. So the core product still remains the value offer, now quite a degree more co-created when you're in the service environment. You play a role, you participate, you are present quite often at the point of the service being provided. And the tangible objects, the physical elements of a service, move out into the augmented product. So that's the big fundamental shift here, is that inside a goods-based approach, in the core product model, you would be thinking the core, the value, then the actual, which is the features of a physical product, and then services may exist at the augmented level. In a services product, the core is still the value offer, but the intangible element, the service delivery, the application of skills, the role of co-creation and the role of the staff member in creating the environment for the service now occupy the actual and any physical artifacts that are present occupy the augmented. So if we think of the value offer now as the application of skills by people, uh, we look at things like you know, a mechanic applies their skills to an object, your car. A dentist applies their skills to you, so it's skills to people. An accountant applies their skills to a service, applies their skills to finances. And a film reviewer applying their skills to the experience. So functionally, intangibility moves us into this really interesting space where it's a lot easier to create new products because you don't need an inventory and you don't need some hardware, but it's a lot harder to explain that new product because you can't capture it by image, photograph, or standard means. So we focus now on the delivery of the intangible over the delivery of the tangible when we're talking about services. The next area is the idea of inseparability. Now, with a physical object-based approach. You can create the object in one place, use your distribution channel, and retail the experience somewhere else. Even with co-creation of value amongst the three different value types, value in ownership functionally still separates, whereas value in use brings in inseparability as a core feature now of 
uh, good space marketing. But the origin, the reason why it's called service dominant logic is that this is a framework that came from the services marketing platform. So inseparability builds to this idea that you are going to be present at the point of the service. For example, you go to the dentist, you are present in order for the dental work to be done, you need to be in the room. Same for hairdressers, physiotherapists, massages. We're not at a point where you can just drop your body off, continue with your consciousness, and then come back and pick your body up later. You need to be present for certain types of services to happen. In other services, the inseparability occurs with the artifact. So a dry cleaner or a mechanic, you can leave your stuff, drop it off, come back. They are still present at the point of construction of the service. The service provider is present with your object. It's still now, so one of the things about the advances of technology is we do actually have the ability to prepackage services a lot more, but you still need to be present then at the point of consumption. So point of creation, co co-location, point of process co-location, point of consumption co-location. So co-creation value becomes important, particularly if you're doing something like you're watching a YouTube video, you're watching TV, you've gone to the cinema. These are all places and spaces and experiences where your presence and your engagement helps become, helps the product to unlock its full value. And in services where interactivity is a key part of the process, Co-creation and co-production are absolutely vital to the creation of the service. Which leads us to the, four, the third element, which is inconsistency or heterogeneity. The experience of a service is unlikely to ever be the same twice for two reasons. First is having experienced the service and your role in the service you will adapt your behavior on the next offering of that service. You go and see a movie that you've never, and it's the first time watching it, then you are reacting in real time to the things on the screen. You go back and rewatch that movie multiple times because it was a great experience, you start reacting before the scene. Your reactions are based on your expectations of what's coming next. So in fact, because you've changed as a customer, you can't get the same experience twice. But this gets even more complicated when we start bringing in a human-based, human-delivered service where the customer varies and the provider varies because both have engaged in a learning activity. Your levels of expectation will change. So you've gone to a service previously, you've now gone from the first time you walk into a service, your assumptions are based on extrinsic information. You experience the service, you gain an internal intrinsic view. You learn about the service, you learn about your role in the service. It may be that your first experience of a service isn't particularly great because you don't know what to do. It may take multiple iterations of using the service for you to experience and find your role and find your co-production balance with the service providers. There's also the fact that as humans, we're all inconsistent. Our level of energy, our level of capacity, our willingness to engage, these all vary and so do the staff members. And there's that distinct thing between a veteran, someone who's been to the service a lot, and a newcomer, because there are certain skills you need in order to fully get to get access and to get the best benefit out of your service. Even as something as basic as take out coffee. New coffee shop, you're not 100% certain of the order process versus regular coffee shop where you can do the script faster than the people behind the counter can. So there are certain points where the inconsistency also works in our favor. Inconsistency is a benefit. Because services are co-created and co-produced in a, sometimes in a one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in a one-on-many environment, 
that the ease to which we can customize, aka making consistent, is a benefit that we can use to develop new products, to create a co-created experience that fits the needs of the individual. So modifications are far easier because services can be inconsistent. It's a lot easier to give you a better service that is not the same as your previous or your next service. But the value that you gain can be consistent across the board because we make modifications. So you walk into a hairdresser's to get a haircut and you answer, they say, well, what style do you want? You've got a job interview and it's, I need, some, I need to look professional for the job interview. You're going to a major social function. It's like, I need to look good for the wedding. You're just wanting a change. There's been a recent breakup. It's like, I, you go to the hairdresser and say, hey, I just broke up with my partner. They'll like, got it. Completely rebuild your image. Go into the hairdresser and say, listen, I need something corporate. They'll rebuild your image. Functionally customized, inconsistent, different from the previous experience, and that's a feature, not a bug. So skills in the transaction are also a significant um, facet of inconsistency. The greater skills someone has, the easier it is for them to modify the service to make the service fit the needs of the customer. And also the scaling challenge that whilst customization is a positive, it can, flexibility creates challenges. If you are relying on the skills of an individual to create custom experiences, they, people don't scale. You need to get multiple individuals in. Everyone's got different, slightly different styles. So there are some challenges. There are some benefits because there's a lower infantry um, around custom services, particularly when you're creating a custom service in real time, that you don't need to stockpile many different versions of the service you can just create it in the interaction with the customer. But at the same time, whilst that's a feature, that may be a challenge of you create a really good interactive, high touch, high custom experience with your customer, that takes time, effort and energy that you may not be able to replicate multiple times. So again, these are all trade-offs that we talk about in the services marketing subject. Uh, but what you need to be thinking about from our perspective is that a physical good has some advantages. Consistency, mass production. The inverse of that is also an advantage. It's not a disadvantage. Everything is context and opportunity dependent. Which leads us down to inventory. You can't stockpile a service. The closest thing we have to service stockpiling is the creation of pre-recorded videos. Uh, the creation of recorded content, digital content, automated systems. But even so, you can't go back in time and services are time sensitive. So perishability is all about the idea of time sensitivity. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, the most practical application of time travel will be to go back and use hotel rooms that weren't in use that night. So you just pop back to last Tuesday, store yourself overnight, pop back the following morning. I know, that's my, uh, we invent time travel and I come up with the least glamorous thing for it. I have what if, but for time. The other thing with the inventory is the automation creates, automation creates consistency but loses the flexibility. So scripting, automated systems, uh, anyone who's selling you AI for services is lying to you, so just ignore them. We are nowhere near advanced enough to be able to do artificial intelligence-based services. It's just not a thing at the moment. What we do have is we have script-based, if this, then that choice uh, bots, options. We can have the appearance of artificial intelligence if we have a robust enough script, but basically that's like assuming uh, Fallout 4 had artificial intelligence when it just had a lot of scripting trees. So the key idea, raised this earlier, going to repeat it here to close uh, the loop. The core 
idea of a service product is that there is a state change. An object, an idea, or a person enters the service and they, are, they experience some form of state change. The actual product is the skills application by the service provider or their proxy. So an automated service through a machine is a proxy skills application. And the augmented element is the physical evidence that's used in the service delivery or used as an artifact to show a service took place. To that end, services comes with uh, three extra elements of the marketing mix. I just want to briefly point out them here. Stay on your four Ps for marketing for this semester. But your third, your additional th three are physical evidence, which is any tangible aspect of the service, the process, which is how the service gets delivered, and the people, the, those responsible for the delivery of the service. And again, we've got a whole subject that I can go into that into detail later. I do want to mention a couple of the central ideas because they are super useful for you in understanding basically how the world operates as a marketer, but also that moment where I should point out to you, education is a service. So welcome to actually experiencing your theory in real time. So let's talk first, zone of tolerance. The zone of tolerance is the area between the service you desire and the actual service you experience. Anywhere between desired and adequate is acceptable for service delivery. Hence, it's the zone of tolerance. If you're in the box there, the customer's mostly happy. If you're below the box, that's bad. If you're above the box, that's difficult. If you exceed the desired service, then you've got some you will move up the perception of what the service should be like or could be like. But basically, the zone of tolerance is a perceptual event. It's a subjective measure. It's what the customer expects and their expectation is based on advertising, it's based on external, it's based on whether they've had the experience before. And the perception is also subjective, it's based on how they feel during the environment. And noting that inconsistency is a thing that you can go to the same service provider two days in a row and get two radically different experiences where nothing has changed at the service, you're the one that's changed. So you go in, you order something off the menu, new item off the menu, and mind-blowingly amazing. Your perception of what it should be will be different when you go in day two, you order the same thing. The gap between what you're expecting and what you got delivered doesn't provide you with as much delight this time. It's suddenly this mind-blowing experience from Monday is adequate on the Tuesday because your expectation has changed on the basis of the previous experience. So it is subjective and humanity is subjective, so it makes it fun. Uh, in particular, a couple of things we want to point out is that there's a thing about the zone of tolerance is if you're satisfied, adequate expectation, that's good. Ultimately, as a marketer, we actually want adequate way more than we want delight. There will be a bunch of people who will try and sell you stuff on the basis of saying, oh, you always want to delight the customer. Like, no, no, that's not true. You always want the customer to have had an adequate experience so that they will come back again. Delighting the customer constantly is a Cold War arms race against your capacity to beat their expectations and your constant raising of their expectations to the point it exceeds your capacity. So you want to avoid that. You want delight outcomes are great when they happen, if they happen naturally, but if they go beyond, if they happen frequently and you're just constantly trying to push for the delight, you will burn out your service. You will reach a point of no return where you cannot beat your last performance, you cannot beat the previous act, and therefore you cannot beat 
the delight requirement. The second model I want to talk to you about is the service gap model. Uh, this is just a quick highlight. This is one of the theories that you'll deal with a lot in the services marketing subject. But it's basically to say that we do have a very good way of handling the manufacturing and performance of services and a full theoretical framework based around five gaps. And it starts from the gap between what we expected and what we perceived, and then ask the question of how did we get to that gap? Did we understand the customer needs? Did our service standards meet the requirements? Did we communicate what's a realistic promise for our services? And did we design a service that fit the need of the customer? So the gap model, it's a thing I want to highlight. It exists. Uh, you, it's a really useful thing when you go into being a services marketer to come to terms with because it comes with a companion theory. And that companion theory is the service quality. Surf qual is a measure. Surf qual is a statistical instrument. It consists of five categories and a variable number of questions that go in each category. So it can be somewhere between 15 to 30 questions. And how it's applied as a research object, as a market research object, is that you do a pre and a post. You do a pre-survey asking for expectations. And you ask them down the five rata categories. And it's genericized a little bit of a service should be well delivered. A service should be consistent. A service should be trustworthy. Service staff should be trustworthy. Physical objects in a service should be clean. It's bang, bang, bang. Also, I want to point out, physical objects in a service should be clean works really well as a question until you start asking about the Tough Mudder course, where it's an obstacle course through a mud field. No, those objects should not be clean. They should be filthy and dirty and everything else because then that's the experiential thing. So you deal with five factors. Reliability. And this one breaks down to how well will the service be performed? Assurance is how confident people are based on the behaviors of the staff. Uh, Tangibles also play a role in confidence raising. It's what do the physical artifacts that are acting as proxy measures for our judgment, what do the physical artifacts do inside the environment? What do they look like? How do they work? How do they facilitate the service? Empathy is, again, staff, but also company-based in terms of policies. Do because we're engaging in person to person, because we're engaging in skills based services, empathy is around does the staff member show a sense of understanding of the needs of the customer? So empathy can come in in a positive way of I felt that my service was well created and co created because I felt the staff member looked after me. It can be used in the recovery of I felt that they. You know, when the problem occurred, I felt that they were genuinely trying to help me. And the last one is the responsiveness. Now, responsiveness basically is about how the service reacts in the dynamic. So it's the reaction time, it's the interaction, the speed. So if you think empathy is the caring, responsiveness is the speed to which the, the event occurs. So you go in, you engage in a service, so you go to check into a hotel and your booking is ready. It's under the right name. It's the prepayments have all gone through. A staff member at the counter greets you happily, walks you through the process quickly. There's no problems. Everything goes well. They ask you if there's anything you, else you need. They offer uh, recommendations for the local area. And if you sort of come in saying, oh, hey, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm jet lagged as all get up, they're like, right, we'll make it quick and get you in through done. Also, here's your bonus do not disturb sign. Uh, 
showing empathy, showing understanding. So basically, it's all about how the transaction transpires across five criteria that help you judge your service, but also helps you make some decisions around your service planning and your service product development. Lastly, the last theory we want to raise is I want to draw your attention to the existence of a concept called ServiceScape. Again, it's a big part of the services marketing framework, but bringing your attention to it here and now is also going to help you when we get into looking at things like retailing, because the ServiceScape is the physical environment of the service. It's the landscape in which a service takes place. So, Ultimately, there's a series of connections and conditions underneath, but it comes down to three things. Those three elements are, do we want the customer to approach us? So do we want approach or avoidance? Can we use the service scape to attract the right people to us and drive the wrong people away? And is the service scape designed to facilitate a transaction, a social interaction, or the performance of a skills-based outcome. Now, if it's designed to facilitate a skills-based outcome, there may be front stage, backstage, there may be elements that we don't need to see. If it's designed to facilitate social interaction, then it should be easy for customer and employee to communicate and engage with each other. Um, and also, it may be designed to facilitate customer to customer social interaction. So ServiceScapes, are, again, it's one of those big theories that we're going to go through a lot in the services marketing subject, but drawing your attention to it now, it's a thing that exists as a framework to describe a physical environment in which a service takes place. So to recap, services marketing, it's a semester length subject that we operate here at the ANU. The key things that you want to be walking away with understanding at this stage is that it is a distinct area of marketing. Knowledge from this area has informed some of our understanding around how physical goods are used. Particularly some of the frameworks from co-creation of value originated inside services marketing, which is why it's referred to as service dominant logic when it's dealing with physical goods. And that this is a teaser. This is a trailer for a much bigger exploration of the framework should you go on to stay in the marketing major and do the services marketing subject.